So we're going to talk about fluoroscopy and needle manipulation. You'll be doing this, uh, if you're a pain management physician, you'll be doing uh, procedures under fluoroscopy guidance. Uh, and it's very important for you to understand what fluoroscopy is and also needle manipulation. How do you manipulate a needle in, into the human body? So that's the uh, trick of a pain management physician. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to, talk, going to talk about the equipment first, what we use, what is fluoroscopy, and uh, biological effects of radiation, which is very important. Um, radiation safety, because we are exposed to x-rays through this uh, uh, modality. So how do we keep ourselves safe while using a fluoroscope? Measures to minimize the risk of radiation. Qualifications to use a fluoroscope. Who should use a fluoroscope? Needle insertion and manipulation techniques. So coming to the equipment, the fluoroscopy, this is the fluoroscope as you can see, see it. So what are what is a fluoroscope? It's basically a machine that generates x-rays, right? So fluoroscopic x-rays are carcinogens and can harm both the patient and the practitioner. So all of us have to be aware of that fact that we are exposing ourselves and the patient both to carcinogens. When applied with prudent limitation, they are highly useful tools providing benefits far in excess of the risks associated with the carcinogen. So we have to understand the risks and benefits of any intervention that we do particularly using x-rays. The x-ray beam produced by a fluoroscope is a diverging beam composed of billions of uniformly distributed x-ray particles traveling toward the patient. So what is the image? The image that you see is the non-uniform residual beam that emerges from the patient generated by x-ray interactions as the beam passes through the patient. That's what the uh, image is. Let's look at the components of the fluoroscope. Look at this picture now. And as I go here, that is the x-ray generated. That's where x-rays are produced or generated. That's the x-ray tube. Collimator. What is the collimator, guys? Huh? Something that cuts down the, the x-rays, right? You can reduce the the amount of uh, radiation using uh, collimator. Grid, the image intensifier, optical coupling, the video camera, and finally the monitor. That's the pathway. Now you'll, you've, let's follow the pathway of the x-rays. Where do they start? This is the patient and table, of course. And then the x-ray tube, the image intensifier, that's where the AC current is coming. It is converted to DC, and the x-rays are generated. They pass through the patient, and they're scattered. See the arrows? That's a scatter. And then finally, it goes up to the monitor. There's, that's where you see your image or the picture of the x-ray. So that's how the um, x-rays go. Once again, the, all the same things which you saw in, in, the, in the cartoon are now in the, in the real time um, here. It's a ma machine. X-ray generator is that. And the AC current is coming that way. That's the X-ray generator there. You shoot the picture, the image intensifier, and then it goes on into the uh, image, uh, where you see the image. Now coming to the biological effects of radiation. They can be divided into two kinds. One is the stochastic effect and one is the deterministic effect. So what is the stochastic effect of x-rays? A change in a single cell might result in an adverse consequence. It's not how much x-rays that you, you are exposed to. It's one, the change in one single cell can result in an adverse consequence. The probability and not the sensitive, the severity of the induced effect increases as the dose increases. The probability that something bad may happen increases, not the severity. That's the stochastic effect. Any exposure to radiation, no matter how small, carries some risk. Okay? Any exp exposure. One X-ray beam can cause damage. And that's what the stochastic effect is. Neoplastic effects of ionizing radiation and heritable changes in the genome 
of reproductive cells are the principal forms of stochastic risk. So any cancer that can be caused by radiation is a stochastic effect, right? Or any heritable changes in the genome of the reproductive cells are the principal forms of stochastic risk. So that is the reason why we will not allow any pregnant women anywhere around the X-rays. So biological effects of radiation, deterministic effect. Now we talked about the stochastic, now the deterministic effect. When delivered in a sufficiently large doses, X-rays can cause injuries to tissues and many cells need to be damaged before the outcome is clinically manifest. Injury cannot occur unless a minimum threshold dose is crossed, after which the likelihood of observing the effect increases rapidly and the severity of injury worsens as the dose increases. Radiation-induced cataract is a good example of deterministic effect. Skin injury is deterministic. This, that's a picture of Dr. Rax. That's who I trained with. I, in fact, I took that picture. That's his hands. And that, that's what happened to him over a period of years when he's, he was exposed to so much radiation every day. And there is so much of skin changes, even bone changes you can see in, uh, in his hands. And this is another radiologist, Casabian. And look at his hands. And finally, he died of uh, uh, radiation-induced cancer. So it's all real, guys. What we think is because we don't see x-rays, they can't harm us, right? No. Wrong answer. So they, they do harm us. They do harm the patient, more importantly. What do we say? Primum non nocere. First do no harm, right? But we are doing some harm. So, so you, have to, you cannot be nonchalant about this. You, know, you have to be very, very careful when you're using a fluoroscope, and you have to be very aware of all these effects. These are burns and skin injuries caused, caused from repeated exposure uh, to fluoroscopy uh, to treat pulmonary tuberculosis. So, I mean, look at that. That, that is, you know, that's sad. And even this, look at the uh, skin injury from uh, repeated exposure to fluoroscopy there. Now, we have talked about the effects of radiation. Now, how do we keep ourselves safe from the radiation. We do procedures under fluoroscopy every day. I do it every day. So I need to keep myself safe. I need to keep the patient safe. So uh, radiation safety. Even my daughter knows to wear an X-ray vest. That's my daughter. So um, when she comes to my office, she wears the radiation. Not that she's exposed, but I just thought it would be funny. So, um, so she's wearing a, a radiation uh, vest. So how do you limit radiation exposure? This is the principle called ALARA, or as low as reasonably achievable. Time. Keep the time to the minimum amount of necess that is necessary for the procedure. Intensity. Keep the beam intensity to, intensity to the lowest levels necessary. Distance. Maintain appropriate distance. Right? Distance is inversely proportional to the amount of radiation that you get. Shielding, wear appropriate shields. How, 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 what measures do you take to minimize risk? Recognize that dose rates are greater and dose accumulates faster in larger patients. The bigger the patient, the dose accumulation is larger. Keep the current as low as possible. The amperage to as low as possible and the voltage as high as possible. Keep the patient at a maximum distance from the X-ray tube as, and as close to the image intensifier as possible. But there's a problem there. You need space to, to put the needle. So that's the problem. So, but take the minimum space that you need. So don't, you, don't you know, raise it as much. Just take the, the, the very minimum space that you need to put the needle. Because remember, the X-rays come from the bottom, right? not from the top. So uh, just take the minimum space you need. Always collimate down to the area of interest and do not overuse magnification. Do not magnify images if you don't need to magnify them and collimate it. Collimate are, collimate, collimators are lead plates that come across the field and they, they cut down on the amounts of x-rays coming, coming out. So collimate, collimate and collimate. 
All personnel must wear protective aprons, use shielding, monitor their doses. I monitor my doses. Uh, there is a badge that you get, radiation badge, and you have to wear it outside. That way you know how much radiation you're getting on an everyday basis and know how to position themselves in the machines uh, for minimum exposure. Keep beam on time to be to an absolute minimum. So don't put your foot on the pedal and keep pressing it when you are not when you don't need it. So please be aware. Qualifications to use a fluoroscope. Who should use a fluoroscope? You better know what you're doing, right? You don't do it unless you, you know what you're doing. So you have to have some proficiency in the medical pro procedure. If you're going to take 15 minutes doing an epidural steroid injection, you're in trouble, right? The patient is in trouble. So you, you got to be quick, you got to be fast and, and do it quickly. Fundamental knowledge about the production and behavior of x-rays, you have to understand what x-rays do to you, you have to understand what the x-rays do to the patient as well. Proficient knowledge and in and responsibility for safe practices by all personnel. So you are responsible. You are the physician in the room. So you have to be responsible for all the personnel that they are with you in the room. The radiation technologist, the patient, or whoever it is, uh, the assistant that is helping you, all have, uh, all have to wear lead. And you are responsible to take care of, uh, of them. Knowing and appropriately applying the radiation limiting features of the fluoroscope, like I said, you know, we discussed all that, collimate it down, you know, uh, uh, use uh, lower uh, amperage, and so on and so forth. That is about the radiation and radiation safety. So having finished that, now coming to the more important topic of needle insertion and manipulation techniques. So guys, all of us hold needles. What are needles? They are dangerous instruments, right? They are dangerous instruments. Uh, so be very, very aware of the fact that you're holding a dangerous instrument in your hand. And, and that's what every time that you stick a needle into a patient, you need to be aware that that is a dangerous instrument. Placing needles safely into the body requires advanced tactile skills, right? You need tactile skills in your hand comprehensive knowledge of anatomy and expertise with fluoroscopy so you need all the three prior to beginning a procedure it is incumbent on the interventional pain physician to assure that the setting is appropriate for efficiency and patient safety so make sure everything around you is efficient and safe that's your job facilities that provide interventional treatments must have nursing staff trained in resuscitation techniques, resuscitation equipment, including a complete crash cart with airway management supplies, suction, IV, IV resuscitation medications, as well as high quality fluoroscopy equipment in a room of adequate size. I have every single one of this in, in, in my office. I have a procedure room. I have everything set there. I have uh, all of these uh, ready to go. Uh, resuscitation, because you never know, uh, you know what can happen during, uh, during a procedure. So. Um, Set up, how do you set up uh, a procedure room? The head of the table is oriented to the far end of the room. I'll show you a picture here. That way you understand the, uh, that's my procedure room. So the C arm is on the right of the table and the practitioner is always on the left of the, uh, of the table and the patient's head is towards the he head of the table. So and the, ta the table is oriented towards the uh, far end of the room. Now, how do you orient the fluoroscope? Orient the fluoroscope and obtain an image by placing a metallic density object so that the top of the image represents the cephalid part of the patient and the left side of the image represents the left side and the right side is right. So left is left, right is right. Top is top and bottom is bottom. It seems very simple, but it's not. So you have to be careful when you look at a picture. You're not looking at an X-ray picture, right? So you are looking at a fluoroscope picture. So the left side of the patient has to be the left side of the picture. The right side of the patient has to be the right side of the, uh, uh, the uh, picture, and so on and so forth. With the patient prone, right? So, so if you look at the, uh, the table again, the orient the fluoroscope nicely, and then look at the picture, and put a metallic uh, object. In, in this case, it's the forceps there, and you can see you know, left is left and right is right, and, and top and, and bottom. So 
you get a good or orientation of the fluoroscope first before you do anything else. The second thing you do, first you position the fluoroscope, the second thing you do is position the patient. Like real estate is location, location, location. In, in, in interventional pain management, it's position, position, position. If you don't position the patient very well, you'll never get anywhere with any, position, uh, any, any um, procedure. Positioning the patient optimally on the procedure table is extremely important and may make the difference between success and failure of the procedure. Most interventional procedures have performed with the patient in the prone position, although for certain procedures the patient is placed supine or lateral, like let's say you're doing a stellate ganglion block, you may have to put them in supine position. And coming to visualizing the target. In order to successfully advance a needle through the skin and into the pain generating target in the body, one must first be able to visualize the path leading to the target with the fluoroscope. So you have to be able to visualize in your mind's eye what is the path that the needle takes from the skin to the, uh, to the uh, final uh, position. The practitioner must use the fluoroscopic images to visualize in the mind's eye the relevant anatomy between the skin insertion point and the anatomical target in order to anticipate the various anatomic structures penetrated and bypassed by the needle as it advances. If you look at the picture, what do you see? If you, if you want to look at a lumbar spine, all you see is bone, right? That's all you see. But that's not all there is. There's a lot of stuff from the skin to the bone. So you have to know in your mind's eye what your needle is traversing every second while you're, while you're advancing. All you see on the X-ray picture is bone. But that, so you, you have to be uh, very aware of, uh, in, in your mind's eye, the, the image should pop up here while you're doing the procedure as to what structures my needle tip is crossing. So the eye cannot see what the mind does not know, right? So you better know your anatomy. Your anatomy will haunt you for the rest of your life. That, and that's what it is. So you better know your anatomy very well. And that's, that's what, you know, uh, I learned all my anatomy on the cadaver. I did not read any textbooks. I'd, all my anatomy was on the cadaver. And that's what taught me anatomy. So that is the reason why cadaver courses are important for you to, to, to figure out. You can read a textbook a hundred times but you still have to understand the, the, the anatomy. So the I cannot see what the mind does not know. So visualize the target. So this is the, next, the fluoroscope picture of a lumbar spine, right? What do you see here? The bottom, can you, can you tell me the, the bottom, uh, is it L5 you think? Yeah, L5, L4 and L3, because you can see the iliac crest coming off on the left, so that's uh, uh, L5, L4, and L3. So when you see this picture, all you're seeing is bone, right? But you have to know what else is there. So that, that picture on the right side will tell you, you know, what all you can see. That's on the lateral view and the uh, uh, AP view on, on, on that side. So that's how you have to imagine when you look at an X-ray picture. Now, once you've visualized the, the, the target, choosing the proper skin insertion point is one of the most important aspects of successful fluoroscopic injection. So you have to start in the skin, right? Your, your target is a few centimeters, or sometimes a few inches away, but you have to choose a skin insertion point, and that is the single most important thing that you have to do. If the skin insertion point is not properly chosen, the practitioner will be fighting against this suboptimal starting point for the, for the entire procedure. So you better choose your skin insertion point very, very carefully, otherwise you'll be fighting all through the procedure. So let's say I want to do uh, interlaminar epidural steroid injection in this patient at the L5-S1 interspace on the right side. If, if Look at the, the position of the... Uh, um, the, the, the opaque object that, that is pointing, it's a pointer, it's pointing to the right of midline, right? Everyone agree that is right of midline? Yeah, in the L5-S1 interspace, everyone agree? So that's where I want to go. So that's where I, I put my pointer. I can look at the pointer on the X-ray. 
So, but my pointer is on the skin, right? So that's where the skin entry point should be. And do not skimp on your local anesthetic. No, you are you are causing pain. You are sticking needles into people. So please be gentle and please be kind. Use local anesthetic, you know, as much as you can to lessen the pain of the needle placement. And it requires minimal time and effort and makes the procedure much more tolerable. So please be generous in using a local anesthetic. Most of these procedures are done under local anesthesia, right? Most of them are done under local uh, local anesthesia. So. Uh, for certain, certain advanced procedures, intravenous conscious sedation may be indicated, but be very careful when you use intravenous sedation. Be very, very, very careful. Now you've chosen the, the skin entry point. Now, you, now it's time to put the needle in and stick it to where it needs to go. So how do you advance the needle? Small incremental steps to specific targets within the body is the essence of interventional pain management. So you have to go in very, very small steps. You cannot shove the needle in, you know, two centimeters, three centimeters at a time. You have to be very, very gentle and small increments. The art of safely and accurately placing needles and directing them to specific targets takes time to develop. So it is not something that you acquire overnight. So the more you do, the better you get. As simple as that. The modern day interventional pain specialist must combine learned tactile skills, tissue feel, with expertise in fluoroscopy. So, yes, you're looking at the x ray picture. You can see the bones, but like I said, you don't know what soft tissues you're passing. So, at any given time, your, your finger should be able to tell you what tissue you're passing. The feel, the tactile feel. Yes, now I'm in the skin. Now I'm in the subcutaneous tissue. Now my needle tip is passing through the interspinous or the supraspinous ligament. And then now I'm going to the interspinous ligament. And then now I'm going, in, going into the ligamentum, flavum. And, and then you have the loss of resistance for a typical epidural steroid injection. So the tactile feel is what is important in addition to the fluoroscopic guidance. It's important for the practitioner to develop educated fingers with respect to the feel of various tissue densities that are traversed by the needle during the, the advancement. So you have to develop educated fingers, which is what I said. Okay, at any given time, you have to know what, where the tip of the needle is, which, which tissue is it passing through. Once the needle tip passes through the skin, it is no longer visible to the naked eye, right? Once you, it goes below the skin, it's no longer uh, you know, visible to the naked eye. So you can't see it. So you don't know whether it is going medially or laterally or superiorly or inferiorly once it passes the skin. That's where you use your fluoroscope to guide the needle. But the fluoroscope can track it for you, right? In multiple planes. You have to understand that the arm of the fluoroscope tilts, angles, rotates, and all these functions can be used to obtain the best picture needed. So there is almost, if you look at this, this picture on the left, there is a, it's, I think they were planning to do a, a, either a, maybe a selective nerve root block, they're looking at the superior article process there, and they, they, they couldn't uh, look at it. All they did was tilt the fluoroscope up, give, them, give it a cephalid tilt, and you open up the space there nicely. So use all the features of the fluoroscope. Use it as your third eye, right? You have two eyes, and use that as your third eye. Coming to the 3D technique, if you don't take anything away from this class, take this one point away from, from, from this class. It's called direction, depth, and direction. So what do you mean by that? When you get an AP shot, AP view of the, uh, the X-ray, what do you see? All you see is direction, right? Where, which way the needle is going, medial, lateral, superior, or inferior. That's all you know. You do not, do not know the depth of the needle. So then you get a lateral view. Then you get the depth. Then you come back again, you get the direction. So 3D, depth, direction, and 
direction, depth, and direction are the three Ds used to get a three-dimensional view of the advancing needle tip. Anterior posterior view points to the direction which the needle tip is taking. Lateral view on the fluoroscope provides the depth of the needle. What block is that, guys? Not the faculty. What, what block is that? What was that again? Yeah, somebody said that. Yeah, it's a lumbar sympathetic block, right? So if, if you look at the needle in the, in the first picture here, it's an AP view. And you don't know how deep the needle is there, right? All you know is that the needle is sticking somewhere there. And you can see the dye spreading nicely superiorly and inferiorly, right? That's the dye. The black stuff is the dye. And then if you, when you get a lateral view, you can see the tip of the needle going past the vertebral body, the anterior surface of the vertebral body, and then you're injecting the dye. It's going, hugging the vertebral bodies nicely, superiorly and, and inferiorly. That is a lumbar sympathetic block. So that's what the importance of uh, the direction, depth, and direction technique is. The other technique that I want to, you guys to keep in mind is what is called as a gun barrel technique. So what is a gun barrel technique? When a direct fluoroscopic path to the target can be visualized with no intervening bony obstacles, the needle may travel directly down the beam to the target. So if you orient the fluoroscope, your needle has to be oriented along the, along the fluoroscope. So the fluoroscope is looking into your needle. So you're looking into the barrel of the, of the gun. So you should not be able to see the whole needle. You should be able to see the, just the eye of the needle. So that is a gun barrel technique. The direct approach is called the tunnel vision or a gun barrel technique. So remember these two techniques, 3D and gun barrel technique. Look at the needle in the L5-S1 interspace, right? You're looking almost at the, at the eye of the, uh, the hub, actually, of the needle. So that is an example of a gun barrel technique. So orient your needle along the fluoroscope to get a good picture like that. So now you have identified your, your skin entry point. You're, you're advancing the needle. Now, how do you steer the needle, right? Advancing the needle and steering the needle are different. Steering needles within the body is an art and a science, both. The shape of the needle tip and the physical forces imparted to the needle shaft will determine the direction that the needle will move within the body. So how is the needle shaped? If you bend the tip, it moves in a different way. If you use a straight needle, it moves in a different way. So you got to be aware of that fact and how much force you impart to the needle and where the force is important, imparted takes the needle in a completely different direction. The needle bevel and tip bend will determine the direction that the needle will steer, right? How you bend the tip or where the bevel is, that's where the, the needle is going to go. The tip of the needle is the leading edge of a sharp advancing instrument capable of causing injury. That's, like I said, it's a sharp instrument. It's a lethal weapon. So please be, please be aware of the fact that you're holding a lethal weapon in your hand. Controlling the tip of the needle is extremely important as the margin of safety is typically small in interventional pain procedures, right? Like, like anything, trigeminal ganglion block, your margin of safety is a few millimeters entering into the brain, right? So you know, even, even uh, transferaminal injections, you know, epidural steroid injections, your margin of safety is very, very, very thin. So. Safe and controlled needle advancement typically involves two hands on the needle at all times. Don't be cavalier. Always use two hands, right? Always use two hands. This hand, what does it do? It takes the support of the skin and so that it will prevent the needle from going down. So this hand has to stabilize your needle. And, and this hand will direct the needle. Look at the, the picture here. That's the pathway that the needle has to take to the, superior, the tip of the superior articular process there. Right? So that's how the needle needs to go. So how do you track paths with the bevel and the bevel plus bend and rotation? Let's see this. 
That's a straight needle, right? That's a straight tip needle. That's how it's going to go because it's, go, it's going to go in the direction of the bevel. That's a bent tip needle. How, how is this going to go forward? It's going to go in that direction. If you start turning the needle, how does it go? So it, go, it makes a corkscrew motion. So now this is very important here. Pushing sideways on a superficial needle changes the needle tip's direction. So if the needle, needle tip is superficial, you can push sideways and it changes the needle tip's direction, right? That's how it changes the, the needle tip. But let's say the same needle is deeper. So what do you do? Pushing sideways on a deep needle bends the needle shaft without changing the direction. So you can't, you can't start pushing on a deep needle because it doesn't change the direction of the needle. It just bends the shaft. That's what it does. So you got to be careful. How do you change the needle's direction when the needle tip is deep? You apply a two-handed technique and, and start bending the needle gently and that's how you change the direction of the uh, a deeper, uh, you bow the needle shaft. The final position of the needle tip, the location of the needle tip on fluoroscopy in the presence of any bony landmarks in con contact with the needle tip. Let's say you're doing a medial branch block. What is your final end point? The, the eye of the, the scotty dog, right? So the superior articular process, some part of the superior articular process and the, and the transverse process is where your, your needle has to stop. So there is a bony uh, end point there, so you're good. Bony end points are always good, so you know. You, once your needle tip touches the bone, you know. That's where you need to stop, right? So, uh, and then you aspirate. How do you know the final position of the tip of the needle? Always, 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 always aspirate because you, the X-ray doesn't show any blood vessels, right? So you're, you're, the tip of the needle may be in an artery. It may be in a vein. You don't know. So the only way to know is to aspirate. And the spread pattern of the contrast. So once you aspirate the negative aspiration, then you inject contrast to see where the tip of the needle is. Always aspirate before injection. Inject contrast to confirm the final position of the needle and the die spread should be observed to follow confirmed patterns. The same block again, lumbar sympathetic block, right? Once you inject, you have to see the AP view and the lateral view. The lateral view should show the, the uh, die hugging the anterior part of the vertebral bodies. That's what uh, the conf uh, confirmed pattern for a lumbar sympathetic block is. Injection of active medication. Once you know, you, you, you know where the tip of the needle is, you have confirmed it by aspirating that it is negative and then you have injected dye. Now you know the dye spread is nice. Now you're ready to inject your medication. Injection of active medication can be compared to firing a gun. Once the bullet leaves the chamber, it cannot be recalled. So you better be very sure before you fire the gun, right? You, you better be very, very sure. So in summary of needle insertion, what do you do from the, the first step to the last step? One, orient the fluoroscope. Position the fluoroscope. Two, position the patient. Three, visualize the target in your mind's eye as well. And on the fluoroscope, both. Choose the skin insertion point. Advance the needle. Gun barrel technique. All of you understand what the gun barrel technique is, right? Looking down into the, into the needle. Then 3D technique, direction, depth and direction, use an AP view, use a lateral view, and then use an AP view again. Direction, depth, and direction. Control and steer the needle tip, like, like I said. How do you control the, uh, uh, the, the needle tip? We've discussed that. Confirm the final position of the needle tip by aspirating. Aspirate and inject contrast, and then inject medication. So this is how you finally uh, do an interventional procedure. Thanks, guys.